All right, so my name is Carrie Pierce. I'm the Workforce Development Director with the Washington State Labor Council and Health CIO. Um, and these are our two panelists, Rachel Macklin with the Department of Labor and Industries and Melinda Nichols, private consultant slash who, are, who all are you working with? There's a lot. A private consultant, all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> So we were supposed to have two other panelists. One was from the U.S. Department of Labor and one was from Lakeside Industries. Those two individuals canceled at the last minute. So you have the three of us, which means that um, you'll have some expertise on employer engagement, but not the full scope of what we were hoping for. Uh, there's also, the three of us know each other pretty well. So this is going to be much more um, casual than probably some of the other panel discussions that you're going to have. With that said, if there's also some best practices in the audience that you'd like to um, share as we ask, as I ask these prepared questions, if there's something any of you would like to add to that conversation, please feel free to do that. And um, to buy off your loyalty, I have chocolates, so take <laughs> one and pass it down. <laughs> So when you're, when you're surveyed and be like, what was the best <laughs> workshop, yeah, it's going to yeah, be this yeah, one, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and don't live in, let anybody else know the chocolate trick. <laughs> so um, this workshop today um, is about um, employers being at the heartbeat of apprenticeship, right? They're the ones. We can't have apprentices show up on the job without employers engaged and wanting to have apprentices on the job site. So, and they're also the key to the expansion of that apprenticeship. So, to better identify what employers need from navigators and business solutions um, experts, we held a multi-industry roundtable, which Melinda, I believe, you initiated. you initiated and moderated. And that was back in February. <laughs> and then um, the labor community did something similar. Um, when that was about a month later. So we're here to talk about what those results are and um, some of the key resources that were developed because of those conversations. So again, I'm Carrie, Rachel, and Melinda. Okay, so to get a sense of the audience, how many folks are with an apprenticeship program? Raise your hand. Okay. How many folks are with um, K-12? Okay. How many folks are with the community and technical college system? Right, and how many folks are from the workforce development system? Did I, did I miss anybody? If we have an employer in the room, we'll get to <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'll pretend to be employers as well. Thank you. Although, Melinda, what is an employer? What's an employer? So you can speak to that as well. Okay. Okay. So we're going to launch into the questions again. Um, I'll ask them the questions, and but if there's anything any of you would like to add to to that conversation, please feel free to do that. So, Rachel, could you give us an overview of your agency and then also what your specific role has been in employer engagement? Absolutely. So thanks, guys, for being here. My name is Rachel McAloon. Currently, I am the apprenticeship consultant for Southwest Washington. Um, so every um, state participates in registered apprenticeship. It's, it's a federal act called the Fitzgerald Act. And in Washington State, we have our own council and we regulate it ourselves. So I work for Labor and Industries, and we are the administrative arm of the Washington State Apprenticeship and Training Council. Um, Jody mentioned it today, but there's regional ACs across the state. I began my time in apprenticeship under one of President Obama's expansion grants and my primary focus was to go out and do employer engagement and outreach around apprenticeship which that role was the first time the state had ever had a full-time dedicated um, outreach person. And so I learned a lot. I learned a lot about apprenticeship and what the employers need and what they don't need. And I think one of the things that's important when you're talking to employers is 
to, to really listen and recognize to what their needs are, right? So apprenticeship is a great training modality, but it's not gonna work for everybody, right? It is a state regulated system, and it's perfectly okay if we come across an employer who has a great idea, and maybe this isn't what they need, right? It doesn't do anybody any good to send them down this river, you know, if it's not gonna work out for them. Um, we do have regional ACs across the state, so the way that our team does outreach right now is really if there's a regional ask for an employer, it almost always falls on our desk. And that's where usually a best thing to do is to just have a conversation with the employer. Um, we how do, you, how do they find the ACs? So we have a, I mean, word of mouth, referral. We have a website, um, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit in the resources, but lots of times it's just word of mouth. We get a phone call, we get an email. You know, apprenticeship is a buzzword right now. And so I, about 50% of the um, um, inquiries I receive from the public are from employers. The other 50% are from people seeking apprenticeship, right? They're job seekers who wanna join an apprenticeship program. Um, and so as Carrie mentioned, and we've heard already today, you know, apprenticeship starts with a job. And so when we talk about expansion and new industries and new occupations, you know, the first thing we have to do when we talk to employers is make sure we're speaking the same language. A lot of people in our state, when we talk about registered apprenticeship, <coughs> they already have a preconceived notion or they don't know anything about it at all, right? So in this, to me, it's not just about employer engagement, it's just engagement with our society, right? Talking about apprenticeship, what is apprenticeship? It is post-secondary education, it is a training modality. We are a state system that's here to help you build a new, or, or to help you set up a new program. Um, the easiest way for an employer to join an apprenticeship program and get apprentices into their business is to join as a training agent of an existing program. Um, that's just simply the easiest thing to do. But the reality is, is in the, these expansion efforts, is we have to have an existing program for them to join, right? So that's where this other piece comes in and really the education component. Um, going out and talking about what is apprenticeship, how we can help them, how it's gonna benefit their workers, benefit their community, um, retention, skilled workers, loyalty, all those good things, wage progression um, is really a, essential to registered apprenticeship and why it works so well. Um, mm -hmm. Good? Right. You're okay. good. Melinda, so overview of your agency. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I live in North Bend. And, and your role in employer engagement. So my history has all been with apprenticeship. I've been in the apprenticeship system for 45 years. I was a, one of the, uh, the first uh, woman uh, carpenter <coughs> apprentices in the state in 1973. And uh, I went through the college system first for a year, full time, to learn construction. Could not get a job for seven months. Uh, over 100 applications. I got laughed off of almost every job site in King County. Had to relocate up to Bellingham and some guy hired me as a joke, which I really appreciate because it was funny for him and it was fun for me. And that started my career. But I also, I ended up working in, you know, as a carpenter for years, 10 years. And then I ended up getting into management at the city of Seattle because I'd been a carpenter for them and they hired me to run their apprenticeships. I then got on the Washington State Apprenticeship and Training Council as a management representative for 22 years. And so my history has been extensive with the apprenticeship process. Lately, 85% of our apprentices in the state are construction. 85% of that number are union construction. So that's what our system looks like. That's what we're familiar with. That's what we understand. That's what people out in the public understand about apprenticeship. They, you say the word apprenticeship, they think of a hammer or a screwdriver. So for us to do innovations, for us to expand to other employers and to also expand to more uh, construction employers is two different challenges. For construction employers, whether they are a union or open shop, um, there are a variety of existing programs and there's the potential for them to create a program if they want to. One of the main reasons that people do this is it's not a main reason, but one of the reasons is prevailing wage jobs. People understand what that is, what that means, prevailing wage jobs, where it's a benefit if you have apprentices if you're going to bid for a prevailing wage job. The other thing is that when you have a strong apprenticeship program in a construction industry, it empowers your union or it empowers your program forever because you're going to have 
people built into your system and moving through your system and paid and with benefits and all of those things. So it's really a positive thing. When you want to expand to new employers, it's hard. And I have uh, an individual in here who's been working on that with the aerospace industry for, for a long time. She can tell you that to, to convert people to explain, this is really going to work for you. And they're like, huh? And then also we can have uh, I know we have both, all of us, have tried to help new employers get into the apprenticeship system. Let's not pretend that it's smooth. Sorry. I, I ran it. I ran it, uh, the apprenticeship system, retired from running it about five or six years ago. And what people are used to in the apprenticeship system in the state of Washington is the construction industry. So for them to say, yeah, that would be really interesting to do uh, nursing, or it would be really cool to do, you know, any number of things, so, you know, even this, even the staff, not you, she's like majorly <laughs> cool, are going to have some struggles because it's not what they're used to. So, and then if you're trying to provide support for that from other I agencies, and you're saying, yeah, my these people want an apprenticeship, um, you also have difficulties in saying how are we going to pull this all together, and the apprenticeship system works every three months with our apprenticeship council meeting. If you miss the date to do that, hey, guess what? It's another three months before you get to proceed. So part of the thing, I'm not trying to criticize, but I'm trying to be, let's be realistic about our system. And let's look at what its flexibility is and figure out are there ways that we can be more uh, supportive of employers? Because they're not gonna say, oh, another three months, no problem. I'll come to another meeting in Spokane mm -hmm. when I live in Vancouver. Or, so part of this is like how do we, how are we going to recruit employers for apprenticeship when we have a cumbersome system that is used to working with people who already understand it but doesn't know how to embrace the individuals who don't. Then they, they'd say, well, the colleges have to provide us with all the training. Wait a minute, you've got three apprentices. How are you going to get them to have their own training program when they can't afford to do it with three apprentices? So the complexity of this is challenging, but we need to communicate together to get a better shot on how to how to make this work effectively. We need to let employers work together. We need to convince them, you know, and, and it's so true that the first thing to tell them is if there's an existing program that you know looks anything like what you're trying to do, for God's sake, go to that one. <laughs> you know, starting a new one. You've got to, you know, look at the standards. It's it's harder to, to get standards for being in an apprenticeship program in, in this country than it is to be an immigrant, almost. Not anymore, but so anyway, that, that's sort of, the, I wanted to just bring up all of the difficult stuff to get us started. She thought we were in the elephant in the room. Oh, uh, I'm actually wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm wrong. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so what you're saying is uh, to establish an actual apprenticeship program is much harder than going to where it's already there. Absolutely. Because I'm 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 from Walla Walla and I'm an instructor over at Walla Community College, so I'm actually here to try and figure that out. Good. Um, to establish an apprenticeship program at, at our college for. Um, back, my background is I've I've been an electrician for 30 years. And so um, now I'm instructing at the community college. So um, we get these newsletters from L and I, and so the one that came out that really rocked my world was the 2023 20, requirement of apprentices having to be in the apprenticeship program to be able to become a journeyman electrician. Oh yeah, right. Okay, and so license um, occupation. Yes, yeah. So I've I've been union and I've been open shop, mm -hmm. and so more open shop than union. And so um, Walla Walla does not have union shop. And so everyone there is all, they're all open open shops. Mm -hmm. And so trying to get everyone on board as far as established with an apprentice program, I am trying to create that at, at the school so they don't have to travel you know, three hours away to do an apprenticeship. Right. So, so um, here's my advice to you. So um, and we've seen a lot of this in expansion, right? Colleges, mm -hmm. partners, who they want to be an apprenticeship, they want to start an apprenticeship yeah. program. Who's the employer? What's the occupation? Yeah. That's where you need to start. Yeah. What's the occupation? Well, really, I'd say who's the employer? What's the occupation? Yeah. Right? Does it exist elsewhere? Yeah. Right? Copy and paste is a real thing in apprenticeship. Right? Let's not recreate the wheel. Oh, exactly. Um, we've seen a huge expansion in healthcare, <coughs> right? In technology, mm -hmm. healthcare is a booming. I think going to boom in apprenticeship over the next ten years. Mm -hmm. Right? 
So the best place to start, and we've seen a lot of people, and this is just my own personal perspective, you know, I get all these phone calls and all these inquiries like from a college, well, I want to start an apprenticeship program. Well, yeah. college isn't the place to house an apprenticeship program, right? An employer sure. and association needs to house it. So regionally, connect with your chambers, connect with your associations. If you really want to start a new program, the best way that the best way that it works is to have multiple employers underneath it, right? That's really how the unions are set up, yes. right? And the reason that works so well is, um, as Melinda touched on, you know, I still work for a state agency, which means that we have paperwork that backs up paperwork and our systems aren't that great and it can be frustrating, right? There's a lot to it. It's very regulated. Now, that's something that we also have to make sure we're all aware of um, as we move forward in this expansion effort. But also, you know, that can be a good thing though too, because the reason I think that apprenticeship works so well for the employers is because it is regulated. It takes a lot of work to start a new program, mm -hmm. but once you have that program set up, you're really just talking maintenance of it, right? Yeah. Like Jody commented on, you have minimum qualifications for your employees, you have work processes for your employees, you have some type of a rotation and a curriculum. Um, you know, apprenticeship really is about skilled workers. We've heard that a lot today, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so it's just taking that educational component, taking that college, right, that post-secondary education, and connecting it to a paycheck, yeah. right? And isn't that a great thing? But we also have to remember kind of what the construct of apprenticeship is, and it starts with a job. Yeah. It starts with a job. It doesn't end with a job either, right? The job is not, the idea is not that the job goes away when the <coughs> apprenticeship program ends, right? So we have to make sure that these employers are bought in long term, that they understand what it is. It's a multi-touch sale. If you want to go and talk to an association or a chamber or a group of employers, the first thing you do is start by explaining what apprenticeship is, right? There's four components to registered apprenticeship. There's wage progression. There's a national credential when you complete. There is an educational component and there's an on-the-job component. That's what our laws and our RCWs and our WACs hold us to. The great thing about the expansion efforts is it's also very flexible, right? It's regulated, but it's very flexible. There's a lot of ways we can set it up. There's a lot of ways we can work with the colleges, work with our community partners to do um, online cla or classes or front load the education. I mean, there's literally many possibilities about how we can set it up. It's just about understanding from the beginning or making sure from the beginning we all have a full understanding of what we're trying to do at the end which we don't want to set up new programs that are going to close down in two years, yeah. right? We need employers and associations who are totally bought into it that have a system of, em of employers underneath them. My advice to everybody who's trying to expand apprenticeship or start apprenticeship in your community, go to your associations, go to your chambers, work with the employers there, let them help you do outreach. Because the reality is, is the employers main job is not to understand apprenticeship, right? Yeah. They're just trying to get a skilled workforce and retain their workers, right? It's our job to explain why this is a way for them to do it. I think that your particular, you, you've picked one of the hardest apprenticeship programs oh, to no. start that there is. Because oh, no. there are a few programs in, in, that are licensed. Electricians, plumbers, HVAC, those ones, you have to not only develop the apprenticeship, but you have to have licensed journey level workers oversee the apprentices or their hours don't count. Yeah. Oh, so no, I, I know. You know all about <laughs> it. You are an electrician. That. So, so, the, so the, the, my, <coughs> my other part of the question is um, all of these other trades are also going to have to be uh, <coughs> held to those no. same standards too. No, right? no, no. No, okay. No, right, only the licensed sense. occupations yeah, so like held that way. Plumbers and, and plumbers HAC, electricians. Are they going right. to have to be no, yes, as the plumbers, just to, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, as it is right now, what you're talking about, there was a Senate bill passed 6132 this last year okay. that says that in 2023, if you want to be an 01 electrician, you have to go through a registered apprenticeship program. Okay. Now, the reason for that, just to touch on, is because the pass rates, you can be a trainee electrician or a trainee plumber. Those are the licensed trades. Right, you can be a trainee, mm -hmm. go work with an employer, get your hours, take the test, right? Or there's an apprenticeship pathway, which every apprenticeship apprentice in the licensed trades is, is also a trainee. Yes. But the reality of the pass rates for those exams in registered apprenticeship, it's in the 80s outside for just the trainees, it was in the 20s. Yeah. So that's really the, the momentum behind that. Now that law only encompasses 01. Okay. So it does not currently include the other five, um, 
licenses for electricians and okay. it does not include plumbers as it stands right now. Okay, that's that's what I wanted to know. It was, yeah. So right, right now it is just electricians that are required to be a certified yeah, right. electrician or and the, certified and the, to become an O1. Right. right. So Another yes. reason that yeah. it happened is that Oregon has required that for a long time yes. and, and was creating problems with us. With so Oregon. is Union too. Yeah. 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 But, so, yeah. but again, one of the things obviously to do would be for you to look at existing apprenticeship programs yep. to see if they'd be willing to move to to give you the support for your area the electricians union citc who yeah, all so both have, have 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 electricians so we have programs. a board for the program i'm in and actually um i'll be talking to the company or the, the place in spokane they're on our board so i'll i'll talk to them about right helping them right and one of the other things for a lot of you in this room are people who are supporting people yeah. getting ed their educations and, and getting their connections and trying to help employers <coughs> do a better job of ensuring that they have skilled workers and the apprenticeship system is a great system to do that but it's not as coordinated and systematic as, as it, it needs to be so part of this is to try to get also information from you what what's working for you what isn't working for you with your connection with with helping to develop apprenticeship because we I think we can answer better employer outreach questions if we understand from you that you you know if you've already tried and what has worked and what has failed mm -hmm. so do you have any or are you just waiting to find out uh, how to start yeah. One of our things that we get a lot, like we get a lot of people that come, like the city of Spokane just passed the utilization rule in, in the city limits. And we get a lot of out of state contractors that come in that obviously don't have apprenticeship where they're from. And right. so then they're frustrated because they're feeling like they're being forced to join an apprenticeship just to follow the utilization rule that they have. So they come in and they put somebody to work for however long the job is and then and then and then they're gone and they drop membership and they 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 move on so it's it's kind of I, I don't know I feel like some of the rules and laws that we have in our state like make people feel like they're forced to do apprenticeship instead of like this is an opportunity for you guys to build your workforce right I think that's true I think that I mean that that same sort of thing happened with tribes uh, who would uh, join uh, they they would be able to join the apprenticeship program, but as soon as the work moved off the reservation, they would get pushed out yeah. of the apprenticeship. So when you use apprenticeship in a gimmicky way like that, it's not the way it's supposed to be used. And the focus should be on the apprentice and yeah. their whole career. Exactly. So I agree with you, it's frustrating. I think it's important to understand the why, right? The idea behind that utilization requirement is so that you um, we expand apprenticeship and right and we develop a future right yeah, right and it has worked you know in our state we basically you know are have been highly encouraged to utilize apprenticeships in the in the building trades and even that in the O1 electricians when you're talking to employers it's it's really understand explaining the why why that policy exists why that Senate bill was passed and it's because it works really well right you get really really skilled workers right I think that's we ran into that same issue on the Tulalip tribe where a contractor was coming in and building col culverts so like where the fish go into the she's a carpenter yeah <laughs> carpenters don't think no <laughs> um, so they were looking for apprentices and I had to explain we are a pre-apprentice program and he said well send me some people so Billy sent him one guy and um, he hired him and he liked him so much he called for two more. And so he met the qualifications of having someone because he was training them and it, was, it met the state of Washington's requirements that they went to work there. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, it's a seasonal job and they won't work for another three months, but they are happy mm -hmm. and they're gonna go back. He's gonna take them back Good. when the three months are up. So I have, so I, my next question, um, and I'm going to skip over the tools and resources, we'll talk about that at the end, but can either one of you give us an example, especially in the conversation you had um, in February, what are some best practices for employer conversations around apprenticeship? Uh, best practice, one best practice is to ensure that the coordinator that you work with is committed to helping you 
and will recognize what it, and tell you, tell the employer in advance, you know, here are the problems that may come up for you. Uh, the coordinator being the consultant. The, the LNI coordinator, LNI, okay. or whoever it is that's working, to make sure also best practices are immediately link up with LNI. If you're going to do uh, apprenticeship outreach and, and, and apprenticeship expansion, make sure that, that, that you go to LNI and tell them I need to, to connect with the uh, apprenticeship uh, consultant or coordinator. Um, best practices also are tell the truth about yeah. what the system is. T tell people it's not easy. It's not, it, it, and here are the here are the barriers. The community colleges may or colleges may or may not be able to do the training, and it may or may not be half price. Because one of the things we sell is, oh, you know, if you're a registered apprentice, your tuition with the community college is half price. And meanwhile, the colleges are saying, well, some say yes, some say no. Understandably, I don't think we need to judge people for saying yes or no. And then, and then also just just take people down the whole pathway because part of it is they get one surprise after another, and it'd be great if they can have an honest conversation, uh, and that that um, best practices are are also that the the person who's doing the work knows what the employer does for a living, knows what their work is, isn't superficial about it, asks to go out on the site, inspect the site, talk to journey level workers, have a better understanding of what what they need, what the goal is for their apprenticeship. So it, you don't get this idea, oh, I know what they want. Listen to the employer, that's a best practice. Don't just uh, run over them. Respect that they are actually the ones looking for this. And also find out why they want apprenticeship. Fundamentally, uh, they want apprenticeship right now because there's such a shortage of skilled work, they're desperate. And it, frankly, for us, this is a great time to be developing apprenticeships, but it's also, they're very busy. And if you distract them, and if you you drop the ball, and and you know that you don't get back to them in, in a regular way, or like I'm too busy to talk to you, that's happening to them a lot in this state, and I'm hearing about it from a variety of employers. So part of this is consistency, respect for who they are, respect for their time, and recognition of how we can move forward together. So when Rachel and I would do tours around the state, um, we <coughs> often met with employers and. Um, Rachel discovered, and you can expand on that, is that just to have the conversation about what really is a registered apprenticeship um, and what occupations could be an apprenticeship, right? So some people were like, it'd be great if we had, um, I don't know, I'm going to make, make this up and it might be a thing and I'm sorry if it <laughs> is. Um, sort of like floral designer, right? So that may not require 2,000 hours of on-the-job training to be a floral, or a CNA. That was the one we kept running into. It's like CNA doesn't have enough hours on the job to, to sort of equal, get you to that 2,000 hours for a registered apprenticeship. So in that case, how, how else can we meet your needs that's not an apprenticeship? But go ahead and jump off. <laughs> Thank you. I think the best thing when you're talking to the employers, especially those first couple of times, you know, like Carrie said, the first thing I want to do is have a conversation, whether or not they think they know what registered apprenticeship is, but we call it apprenticeship 101. Here's what it is. Does this sound like what you want to do, right? Does this sound like what you thought it was? And then I always try to keep the, the conversation as occupationally focused as possible. And that's because, like Carrie said, we have minimum requirements to apprenticeship. So when you think about like a, a scope of jobs really like this, apprenticeship is really, it's not the lowest part, and it's probably not the highest part either, right? It's right in the middle. And a bulk of our jobs, you know, like we just heard today, are gonna fall into that. But oftentimes it doesn't do anybody any good to um, start having all these conversations for an occupation that's not even gonna work. For an association that doesn't have the staff to set it up, right? For, um, and even Melinda kind of touched on this, when you connect with your regional apprenticeship consultants, you know, we're gonna go with who's motivated, right? With who understands it, with who's getting back to us. There's there's a lot to build the standards, but we're here to help you. Um, so just making sure you have those committed partners. And really, what I have written down for here is to listen and to be educated, right? Understand the system. We have so many people out there talking about apprenticeship that maybe don't understand all of it. So spend some time on our web website. Spend, there's a lot of resources we'll go into it at the end. You know, educate yourself first before you're going and talking to these employers. 
because too often I have had referrals come to me um, oh yeah they're on board they want to do it all the way 100% and I'll have one conversation with that employer and it's not at all what they thought it was right or the occupation is not going to work right um, and that's just you know it, it's not going to help us expand by any means from that approach um, you know just be educated about what you're talking about one line I always use with employers is you know I don't work off commission right it's okay we're not in sales you know, I, I do personally think apprenticeship is the best kept secret. You know, if you heard from our Canadian partners, 70, they have a population size of 3 million less than ours, but they have, what, 60,000 more apprentices? Like, that's confusing to me. But I also never heard about apprenticeship until I started working in apprenticeship, um, which is a shame, right? Nobody talked to me about it in college or in high school or even college or even when I worked at L&I before I came to the apprenticeship section. Um, and that's a shame. That's where I think the best thing we do for this expansion in this conference is to just go talk about apprenticeship. Talk to your neighbors, talk to your cousins, talk to your family, talk to your employers about what it is. We need to, in general, if we're really going to be successful with these expansion efforts and get the employers on board, we have to get our communities on board. Understanding that not everybody has to go to a four-year institution. Apprenticeship is post-secondary education. There's an employer uh, <coughs> panel tomorrow that I'm moderating all in the trades or marine or building trades and three out of the four employers their programs get college credit right so it's this perception that we're teaching our youth and our society that it's this less than option and so when we go and we talk to employers it's very difficult because like melinda said they're thinking especially in healthcare or something well that's not this that might work for the electricians or the plumbers but that's not going to work for us right i actually had a, a nurse say that to me and the reality is, is just that that's our own perception of what it is. Um, so just be educated. I think the other key thing to recognize for employers is, number one, they don't have a whole lot of time to develop curriculum and to develop this stuff. This isn't the job they do for a living. They build things, they make things, they sell things, they, you know, they do customer service things, whatever. Number two, they are a profit-making organization. You have to respect that that's what they're there for. They're there to make money. Well, the fundamental reason that they're going to be getting, looking at apprenticeship isn't to be better to our kids, isn't to build the future for everyone to be better. It's like, I'm desperate for decent uh, employees. Got to have some decent employees. If this is a way I can do it, I'll do it. So part of it is that you don't moral witness them. You give them the facts and the data around what is valuable to them financially for doing an apprenticeship program. Their, their connection with the colleges is valuable to, valuable to them. And you also say, let's compare employees who go through an apprenticeship and who don't. The employees who go through an apprenticeship are more efficient, they make you more money, they're more reliable, they're more stable, they'll stick with you longer, you don't train them and then they go off to your competitor. So part of this is to figure out their, you know, what are they thinking about? Because they're not thinking, I, I believe in the apprenticeship system. They're thinking, God, if I don't find a decent employee, I'm not, I'm not going to get this next, you know, I'm not going to be able to bid on this next project. I would say that, that, that's the problem. Just right, what you just said. It, it's finding qualified help yeah. that actually want to work. That, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm also a contractor myself, and we have that issue. Is uh, We can't find people that want to work hard, that want to get in this trade, and be there and be part of this. And if you start a friendship program, these these younger kids, or even even you know, not just younger kids, but anybody yeah. wants a job, if they, they get in this friendship program, they're going to realize that hey, this is going to be hard work. This is what I want to do. Then then employers will see that and say, okay, we can hire this guy. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm investing in them, and they're investing in me. Yeah. So that and the other thing, we've got a <coughs> pre-apprenticeship representative here is that one of the things to do is also pull together, you know, all the support things, all the all the things that can be helpful to get an apprentice who's ready to go to work, who has support, who has some education, who understands some of the things that employers need. Because when you ask employers, they don't say, I want them to have advanced biology. They say, I want them to come to work every day. Mm -hmm. On time, show up. I want them to, you know, to not be looking on their cell phone. I want them to not be smoking weed. I want, you know, just, they have rather, and they say, we'll train them, but we need to have them ready to, to go to work and be serious about what they're doing. 
and maybe you could say a few words about that here. Well, that's it. We have we have implemented. We've always had a rule, but we never implemented it. And now it's I'm training them to call in, and our students receive a stipend. So if they don't call in, there's ramifications. So either you call in, and then you're allowed. And if you call in late, it's bad. It's it's considered not calling at all. So you're late. You don't call in. You're late. You don't call in. You get a letter of warning. The third time you lose your stipend and you have to have five consecutive days of good attendance before you can get it back. I just implemented that. I can't tell you how it's working. Everybody calls. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's my first yeah. step to see. So next time, you're only allowed three at late and then you're out. So I'm changing it so so they know that they're going to lose $6 an hour. It's not a, not a lot of money, but it is if you need it. And so obviously it's working because they're calling. And so I've got them trained to call in, but now I need to train them to be there on time mm -hmm. early. So that's where I'm at now. So my um, son is, oh sorry, my son is in a uh, firefighter in apprenticeship. And um, I texted him for something because there's going to be a food drive. And at some break, he finally stepped, he's like, Mom, I can't text, I'm at work. I'm like, okay, all right. <laughs> good, good, good. Train, good. Train in the moms. <laughs> Go ahead. I feel like there's a disconnect somewhere in the communication with the employers and the apprenticeship mm -hmm. and pre-apprenticeship. Well, pre-apprenticeship, we're working great. I mean, we take in so many from Lisa's program. We work together. We've been working with so many of the schools. We've got this great list of people trying to come into our program. But again, apprenticeship starts with a job, mm -hmm. you know. So we've, we've got all these great apprentices, great candidates. We've got, we've got good ready candidates ready to come in. So where's that disconnect? Because we hear about this decline in the workforce and that there's there's employers that are not taking jobs or not bidding out jobs because they don't have employees or they don't have the pool of employees. We have the pool of employees. Mm -hmm. Where is that disconnect? I think for me it's in the perception. I think when it comes to registered apprenticeship, one thing we talk a lot about is the ROI, right? The return on investment for the employers. But Melinda kind of touched on this. The employers utilizing registered apprenticeship, they're not in it to track how well it's working for them. They just know it's working really well, right? So that's where it's really kind of a struggle when you're talking to an employer who really maybe doesn't understand what it is. And also, you don't have a lot of facts and figures or really even pamphlets and great marketing to help them understand it. So that's where we've kind of started using employer champions, right? What employers, and like Melinda said, they don't have a lot of time. The best thing I can do is connect them to somebody else who can spend 10 minutes, an employer, saying why it works so well, letting them talk about the benefits to their own employees, to their own business, better <coughs> than I ever could, right? Because um, we really, truthfully, I think there's a huge lacking in any type of real return on investment for apprenticeship in the U.S. and that's because we really don't, we haven't used it outside of the trades in the unions. I mean in Washington State we have a thriving um, apprenticeship community because of our unions and our building trades, but in other states of the country that's just not the case, right? There's even less and we really are recognized for being a leader and so that's where we kind of help talk to these other states and we need those employer champions to kind of help us talk to the other employers and just let them hear firsthand what those benefits are and let them hear that they are very tangible. You know, like, you, you made an incentive. It's an incentive to them, and that's why it's working. Um, but it's hard, you know, apprenticeship is it's a hard sell. It's a multi-touch sell, definitely. Okay. Yes, yeah, there was a comment. Go ahead, this one. I mean, to, to, to speak to her point, I mean, I, I work for bricklayers and alley craft workers in Portland. Um, we've hit maximum capacity for apprenticeship we don't have enough journey workers to go around, so we can't bring any more apprentices right. in. And oh. So that's the gap yeah. that we're having. And I think a lot of the programs in my area is the same way. Mm -hmm. So that's why pre-apprenticeship is kind of stepped up because I can't bring any more and have maximum capacity. Mm -hmm. what, what's, what's your number? Is it one-to-one? One, 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 I mean one, one, one to three. And just because of my craft, uh, we haven't went down the road one-to-one, one-to-one one yet. I because we changed that yeah. in the state of Washington. Uh, on the apprenticeship council, when you have a big ballooning and, and you need people for a while and you can, can contract back again, 
you could, my, you my could appeal to change my that. My committee's concerned with, with the work that we do, right. more you you know, elevated and fall. You is, need is oversight. Yeah. Yes, I, the more oversight, the better. And we're just not going to go to that. Yeah, I, I hear you. One to one, one to one. Yeah. And that's true. I've heard that same sentiment from the healthcare community <coughs> that they can't even hire um, people to teach the classes because they're going to make less money. Um, and that's unfortunately something, you know, registered apprenticeship probably. It's a growing thing that we didn't yeah. anticipate. Well, yeah. you can't, because it, we're, a, I mean, the apprenticeship system is a canary in, in the mine, mine shaft. It, it's tied directly to jobs, so we have to move up and then we drop back down. And so we, we are going to be prepared with, you know, people waiting in line and all the journey level people we need. That's not realistic. It's not how, that's not how our, our program works. But an, another thing is we don't have a whole bunch of people that get training, and I don't, I'm don't. i not criticizing the college system, but sometimes you can get training in, in arenas where there aren't any jobs when you when you graduate. So it's it's we it's not a perfect system for anybody. I, I think what you're describing, because we've heard it in, the, in our field as well, it's, it's that silver tsunami, but at the same time, yeah. we gotta work through it. Mm -hmm. yes. Because we can't just all go, well, our ratios won't allow it, so we're just gonna die off. I mean, right. we, we're gonna have to come up with something, whether it's a senior, fourth year apprentice becomes a train, you know, whatever. But what kind of flexibility can we We're gonna use? have to be flexible, because this is like in really, this is like uncharted territory that we're sure. in right now, so. Is there somebody? That's really strong. Yeah, I mean, just to go to the point, I'm from the East Coast. Um, out here, I, I'm a pre-apprentice training program as well, right? I work for. Um, there's a couple of things. One, your relate the ratio is an issue. Um, obviously, in the union uh, arena, that's the ratio thing. But there's two things. If if we they're looking for experience, a lot of the contractors only want experience, right. or they need the experience because they can't put the apprentice on. Right. That's a very big issue. It is. The second issue is that um, the training, when they're trained, are they able to do the job? We're selling them as an apprentice. They have more training, they have all these hours. As part of a pre-apprenticeship, I have the same thing. Our program runs up to two years. We have 800 hours of training, up to 1,000 hours of training they're gonna get between hands-on and, and academic. But are they able to go to work? Can they do the job? We're selling them as someone that can, but they're not doing the job when they get there for the same reasons you're describing. They're on the cell phone, they don't show up on time, they don't want to do this particular job because they don't want to work out with cold or get wet or whatever. So we're, we're, sell, we're trying to sell a product as an apprenticeship being this heads of, head and shoulders above someone off the street, but the reality is, are they? So we really have a, uh, it's a conundrum right now of um, trying to convince them that the apprenticeship is the way to go, but are we delivering the product that can sell that? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question. And um, I wrote Apprenticeship 101 for J Jobs for the Future last year nationally, and I, I taught pre-apprenticeship for nine years. but. Part of it is we're, everybody's kind of struggling with what should pre-apprenticeship look like? What should be included in the curriculum? And a part of it, and Lisa Telford and I have worked in pre-apprenticeship together in the in the forever, for a long, long time, and I've worked with her. She, she runs a pre-apprenticeship for the Tulalip tribe. And part of this is like, what are the things that people need to become apprentices? And one of them is the confidence to go out and do the job. And we can teach them math, we can teach them all kinds of things, but how do you teach them self-esteem, pride in themselves, and, and self-respect so that they don't want to be late and they don't want to miss the class? Work ethic. And, yeah, work ethic. And that's a very, I, you know, I don't have the answer to that. And, and I think our speaker this morning talked about cultural change and what's going on. And so part of this is, how do we deal with the culture that we have? And it's, and it's not just, you know, showing up on time, mm -hmm. put your phone away. It's, can you read a tape measure? Can you can you swing a hammer? Can you use a drill? Can you do you even know what a screw is? I mean that's that's what it comes down to with these kids these days, that they have no idea what any of that stuff is. And and we gotta get that introduced into high schools so that when they do at least get out of high school they have an idea. And I, I mean I, I teach electrical 
in, in college, and I've got students that don't even know how to read a tape machine. Oh, absolutely. And so and that's that's where it comes to. I mean, yes, we 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 preach apprenticeship, but for them to go into apprenticeship, they have to be able to do all this other stuff too. They have to be able to read tape, understand what certain tools are. Well, so, that's why pre-apprenticeship is so great, yeah. right? So we, until yeah. October, had um, a pre-apprenticeship only in the trades, and we just did one in technology. And pre-apprenticeship, I mean, registered apprenticeship is a great thing. Pre-apprenticeship or apprenticeship preparation is a wonderful tool for employers. Wonderful, because you are, you really, it's a great way to vet them, right? And in our state, you have to have, in a pre-apprenticeship program, you have to have some type of articulation to an existing program, meaning that it's not a bridge to nowhere, right? You go through that program, you complete it, you show up, you prove yourself, you learn how to read a tape measure, and the employers have that confidence in you, and you have that confidence in yourself, right? So there, we have a couple. Well, I think the other thing is, oh, sorry. He, he was, he's, yeah. he's first. Sorry. Sorry. Well, there's a, I think there's a foundational misunderstanding of the K-12 <coughs> system and the type of students that are coming in. Um, uh, I mean, the first one is, is I mean, it kind of goes back to the speaker this morning, all students are being pushed towards the university. So students are being driven to a cater, cadre, cater, university admissions requirement. So we have businesses come back and say, and I work in K-12, and we have a full registered apprenticeship in our high school with the AJAC program. Our teachers certified to teach the RSI. Our students will graduate with the 2,000 hour journeyman hours, and they get math, science, and English, and their registered apprenticeship while they're in high school and we collect our FTE while the students are doing this while they're in high school. Um, with, we collect our FTE on the OJT. Um, and what we're finding is this, because we aligned our registered apprenticeship program to the cater requirements. So we're not closing doors on university admissions. The quality of the apprentice goes up. It's not that there's not kids who can read a tape measure. There's not kids who put their phone away. There's not kids that are off the weed. There's not, the, those kids exist. Those kids are not going to trades-based programs because in order to go to a trades-based program, you have to forever say you're never gonna to go to university because you're not gonna get the university admissions requirements. So you're getting a student in the bottom end. When we ran the data on our high school woodshop program, 90% of our students in our woodshop program can't read. I mean, they failed all their state reading assessments. And those are the students that now, as a saving grace, they're, I mean, just in our district, you know, we run the state, you know, running the data, taking my enrollments on ninth grade or in Woodshop, running my data on their reading assessment, 90% of our students in ninth grade Woodshop failed the state reading assessment. Mm -hmm. And and it's, I don't think our district is unique in this situation. It's, 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 students are being told, hey, if you take this class, you're not gonna go to university, and you divide them out. And businesses are kind of feeling that hole. Um, as opposed to when I, we were in Switzerland and studying that data, we were on that. 70% of all students are in a registered apprenticeship program or an apprenticeship program, they don't have that delineation. So we, we track our students and you get the, uh, the, the bottom level academic achievers used as a remediation program and, and that's what you're seeing. Um, the solution is, is we have to make it so when you're in a registered apprenticeship trades pathway, you, could, you can't close the door on the possibility to go to university. As the door continues to be closed, and really who needs to be at the conversation is the council of presidents who's setting the cater requirement, who's shutting that door, um, which is not even good for them. You think if you want to be a mechanical engineer in the United States, we have the largest mechanical, we have the largest engineering waste in the industrialized world because you have to go through 16 years of it, liberal arts-based education and two years of engineering theory. But if you were a machinist, you can't become a mechanical engineer in the United States. I mean, that's crazy because you look at our university admissions requirements. So that's really who needs to join this conversation so we're no longer dividing our students out. Yeah. That's very interesting. <laughs> yep. I also work in K-12 and everything you said was, was spot on, but it's also, it, there's, I worked at the state level too, and there's a lot of things as far as the graduation requirements that we just have of our kids as far as trying to get the kids younger to get them enticed and know what it is. They don't even have room in their schedules to do anything except what's required for them to graduate unless they're taking you know, a career or a CTE class that happens to have you know, maybe it's a work-based learning class, maybe it's a full credit so they get some of those college credits. So also part of the conversation is the relationship between K-12 and post-secondary, because for CTE, the requirement, you have to have a program to study, which means you have to have at least one program that links to post-secondary education or ends with a, you know, industry certified credential. And so we always have that link to post-secondary, but post-secondary doesn't necessarily talk the same language as K-12, and neither talk the same language as the employers. So I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding on how all of it works. There's restrictions by the apprenticeship and WASAC Council as far as what we can do there. But there's there's restrictions what we can do in K-12 and same with the state board of community colleges. 
So it's almost like everybody needs to get on board because everybody focuses on the one problem that's specific to them, but it's not until we all are in the same room that we can figure out you know, ways to address right. it. Right, I think that's really good, a really good point. One of the things about apprenticeship is that it isn't something that kids do right out of high school. The average age of apprentices, now it's 27, it used to be 28. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they go to McDonald's or stagger around and figure out, you know, for years before they go, God, I gotta get a living wage job. So it is an issue. As far as employer engagement, um, I don't know, I, I think that if some employers would be very happy to have young, young people in there and, and feel good about helping them find their career and guide them you know through it I think that uh, our pre-apprenticeship or, or our youth apprenticeship we're just getting started with it we should keep pushing for more innovations with it people should keep trying to do them and we should see how do they work let's see if we can have them in different uh, occupations um, and and then we'll fig we'll figure it as we go some of these things you can't figure in advance you have to do you have to do practices and you have to do Give it a shot, see if it works or not, and then and then expand it if it does. So, was there another question? Okay. I think you had a comment. Well, my comment is that we could do a two-day seminar yeah. like you both just talked right. about, because <laughs> I keep hearing the same circle, we're chasing our tails. Um, basically, I think what we're doing is everybody came out of World War II on a GI Bill and said, yeah, you can go to college, and they all went to college, and we're still, we're still educating like that. And the reality is, is about 80% of them are not going to go to college, and so they're just pretty much fodder, you know, and so until we decide to flip the pancake over and do something different, it would be cool if Washington State figured it out, it's going to be what it's going to be. And it's cool though, at least we're having the conversation now. So I always hear OSPI say, two years ago we didn't talk about registered apprenticeship, and now here they are at our conference, yeah. right? So I mean, it is definitely a culture of change and expansion, not just for our society and understanding and the employers, it's, it's really for the whole system. And if you listen to Brad this morning from Oregon, he is almost singly responsible for reintegrating CTE programs in the state of Oregon that were not there. We took ours out in the 80s. And we're now starting to try to put them back so that they, so that high school kids get an idea of something besides English 101 and whatever. And so I think that it is, structurally speaking, we are flat-footed. We have not, we are not prepared for what we need for the future. And it's, that's why a conference like this is really useful. But again, to get back, we have to ask ourselves, what do the employers need? What's the best way to get it for them? How do we partner with them? How do we listen to them? How do we have them help us develop the apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship? Make sure that in your pre-apprenticeship program, you have employers on a subcommittee who talk about what they need and help engage with your pre-apprenticeship program. That's extremely valuable to do as well. Okay, so I want to get this question in before um, we wrap it up because we've got about seven minutes left, ten minutes left. So let's just say there's a magical unicorn that shows up called an employer and wants to start an apprenticeship tomorrow. What resources, what do you have for them or is there somebody in this room that has resources for that employer to start their apprenticeship in meat cutting in gym? So the first thing, arts, right? So arts is the apprentice registration tracking system. It is a database on our LNI website. If you want to talk to employers, you need to I would probably go through arts beforehand, right? And the reason it's so important is arts, you can search by county and occupation for existing programs. So the first thing you want to do is, is there a meat cutters program that exists? Yes, there is, right? So, you know, give them can a call. Can I be a training agent? Yes, can I be a training agent? And that's going to be the first thing I'm going to tell an employer. Let's do a search on arts. You know, and it's not hard. Lots of times they want you to walk them through it, right? And a statewide program is going to come up too. And then you know what I tell them? Call them. Call them. Being a training agent is an employer to a business to business agreement, right? L and I just simply collects the paperwork. Did you? Did they take your phone call? What's? How much is it going to cost you? You know, what, how did the the relationship feel, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if let's say you're on arts and nothing comes up. Well, next to art, it's going to say contact an apprenticeship consultant. 
If you're in Vancouver, it's gonna be my name. If you're in Spokane, it's gonna be Evie's, right? right? Give them a call, give us a call. But again, we're looking for those highly motivated partners, right? It's a lot of work to start a new program. So especially, you know, if an employer calls me, I'm gonna spend the time with them. When I get referrals from community partners, I wanna know that you guys have already taken the time to explain what it is, explain what it's not, spend that little bit of time, and then send them our way, right? But please, 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 look at arts. Get familiar with arts. If you are doing outreach or you're speaking to employers or job seekers, it's the same thing, right? It's gonna list the minimum qualifications, it's gonna list the standards, it's gonna list everything. It's all there. We're the five minute minute, five minutes, all right. So, so uh, the other thing is, employers can do outreach, but there should be a, a format that tells them exactly what they need to do. It shouldn't just be, I mean, First, of course, it is the best choice to say, uh, is there an existing program you can be a, a training agent for? That's like the numero, the first thing to do. But um, they, they're also, if that isn't gonna work, they need to have college, to reach out to colleges, they need to do this, but they shouldn't have to do this themselves. Right. The apprenticeship consultant will help them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And they need to have one person they can contact. They don't need to be referred from this person to that person to this person because when they do, they are going to let go of the rope and stop doing it. So part of this is customer service for employers. And and not that, show us you give a hoot. We need to both be a two-way street. You show us we care, we'll show you that we care. Because I have had employers who said, I called, I didn't get a call back for over a month. So we need to make sure that not only are that that we also are asking employers if we have employers that are that are going to be in the system or want to be we need to check back with them if they drop out of it three months later we need to call them back and say can you tell me why you dropped out can you tell me why you decided not to do this did you get customer service in an appropriate way so on the callback thing i i would say that my it, the times that i reached out to consultants that with an employer in the area um they've been very aware of the community partners um, that are around and I haven't had any sort of hesitation to call Evie or call Rachel oh, and no. say um, okay this meat cutter association um, wants to start their own they don't want to be a training agent like I tried to convince them to do that <laughs> so um, I'm gonna hand them over to you now let's set up a meeting but they're very aware of their of the resources the college resources ESD resources in the area. Another great resource that um, was just launched I think in October is ApprenticeshipWa.com. So ApprenticeshipWa.com is a microsite that lives on ESD's labor exchange work source law. It's really and good. they have a presentation section. Yeah they have a presentation. Oh yeah that's so, it, they've done so much work. So the great thing about WorkSource WA or ApprenticeshipWA.com is one, you don't have to tell them Elena is involved yet because the first thing they're thinking about is their workers' comp rate, right? right? You're going to come and inspect us. That's true. I think employers are most worried about union. They're most worried about government. Totally. Well, <laughs> and just so it makes sense, right? Elena's mission is to keep Washington safe and working. Evie and I are the and working part. I mean, certainly safe. Right, there you go. Um, but so the great thing about ApprenticeshipWA.com is it's not a... Oh, it doesn't look like a really regulated state agency website. It's not inundated with a bunch of PDFs. It's really clean. It's really pretty. It's really simple. Send them there first. Go there first. Learn there first. Send them there first. It is great level one mm -hmm. information. And once you have them on the hook, then bring in the other components, right? You know, apprenticeshipwad.com is really the sales pitch. It's, and it's got great information for employers for those seeking apprenticeship, and then also some great information for current apprentices, um, or those already in the mm -hmm. system. So we have one time for one last question. So I work for the South Central um, Development Council, and with that being <coughs> said, we are working with Career Connect Law. So if you want to create an apprenticeship, reach out to your development councils, because more than likely, we're gonna jump at any opportunity to help you and build those partnerships for you. I mean, we're con I'm constantly on the phone, reaching out to employers, businesses, creating round tables. We can do the footwork for you. You just have to come find us. So no, make sure to reach out to your, to your development council. Because they're development councils. great, great. Knowledge. That's a really good point. Yeah. You yes. had, he yeah. had one. Yeah. 
So mine's my question probably should have been addressed at the beginning because it, it's really, I think, anybody that's struggling with apprenticeships, this is a key component, is the union piece. Um, I've talked to business groups and they specifically are concerned about, okay, if I do this investment, I'm concerned I'm going to lose this employee that I build to union or to higher wages in another area once they complete the training. So what do you say to combat that? So two things. One, that you two answer. <laughs> wages are driven by industry, right? So our requirements in registered apprenticeship is you can't pay them less than minimum wage and there has to be one wage progression through one bump in, in the apprenticeship program, right? So if the Minimally. unions pay more, the unions pay more, right? Um, that's just what it is. The other piece is there's absolutely nothing in our laws or RCWs that have anything about organizing or being in a union. The reason people connect apprenticeship to unions is because for a long time in our state, they were the only ones to utilize this training modality. The, right? the, the other piece is statistically, if people train, if employers train, uh, apprentices, they're way more likely to stay with their own company. Right. And you can look at all the stats, whether they're union or they're an open shop. I mean, there's just a huge misconception yeah. totally. about a particular um, builders association that is just numb to the work of no. Yet, in the same breath, they're like, give me workers and where do I find them? Right. So, I, no, I in this it. culture of change, and it's okay, so I have to say, I have to say, we're okay. Thank you. Now. But you can uh, come up and talk later, but lunch is next. Yeah. So.